Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, welcome. We're very happy today to have uh, Blaise Boutero uh, from CPHT, who is going to tell us about hydrodynamic diffusion and its breakdown near ADS2 fixed points. Please, Blaise. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Monica, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation. So, yes, I'll be telling you today about hydrodynamic diffusion and its breakdown near ADS2 fixed points which are results that are mostly, the new results are based on this recent paper uh, with Daniel Arian from Madrid, Richard Davison from Edinburgh and Kenta Suzuki, who uh, was a postdoc at Polytechnic with us and left recently for Japan. So uh, yeah, everything in Magenta will contain hyperlinks. So when the slides are uploaded, you can also check out the references more easily if you like. All right, so let me start by briefly reminding you uh, what hydrodynamics is about. This is supposedly a universal description of interacting systems, which is valid in long wavelength and late time regime. So what that means is that we imagine that there are some, that there's some scales uh, where local equilibrium is established. And so we have a length scale, LX, which you can think of as the mean free path, for instance. And there's a time scale, which is the local equilibration time after you've, say, kicked the system. So once local equilibrium is established, then you can do a perturbative expansion in gradients, and each gradient will be suppressed by one of these time scales. And so this is what makes the expansion controls. Another important feature is that instead of trying to track all the degrees of freedom of your system, you only track the relaxation of a few conserved densities and which, which ones uh, you need to track. This is determined by the symmetries of the system. For instance, so if you have a fluid, then you'll just think about the symmetries of your fluid. So you have conservation of translations, rotations, possibly particle number, possibly boosts. And so all of these symmetries give you conservation equations, and they will tell you which are the conserved densities. So typically, energy densities, energy, energy density, charge density, and momentum density. So this, the, so hydrodynamics fits in the, the general class of effective field theories, where we don't, we integrate out the UV degrees of freedom and only focus on a small number of infrared degrees of freedom. And it provides an effective description of many interesting systems that can't be described perturbatively, like the liquid phase of water, electrons in ultra pure graphene, coagulant plasma, superfluids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just to get everybody on the same page, let me let me go back to some uh, basic considerations on diffusive hydrodynamics. So, of course, hydrodynamics takes its name from the dynamics of water, but more generally, this is an effective theory in the, of the kind that I've just described. And the simplest one that we can think of is simply diffusive transport. And this is this is what I will focus on this talk. Uh, we'll mostly talk about diffusion. Diffusion describes the relaxation of the gradient of a conserved density, which I will denote by rho. So for instance, the particle number, which has the, the chemical potential as a source, the energy, which is sourced by the temperature gradient, or the shear momentum, which is sourced by the transverse velocity. One of the simplest examples that we see uh, early on in, in our studies is this example of a reservoir with uh, particles in a, which are separated by a wall and then you remove the wall and then the particles will diffuse from one end to the other end of the reservoir and this is this is controlled by this process of diffusion the equation that governs this system is uh, this conservation equation which starts with the time derivative of the conserved density so the time derivative of the charge density here and then there's a spatial gradient term which introduces a new object the spatial current ji so that entire equation is the conservation equation, and it directly follows from the fact that there's a U1 symmetry that charge is conserved in the system. Now, obviously, we don't know enough about that equation to solve it just yet, because we don't know the relation between J and rho. And so this is what we need to do. And this is where hydrodynamics comes in. Hydrodynamics tells you that uh, you can expand the current in terms of gradients of the charge. So this is a so-called constitutive relation. So at leading order in gradient, the term that matters the most at the longest distances in time 
will be a simple spatial gradient of rho. And that comes accompanied with some coefficient in front, which I've written in this particular way, d over chi. Chi here is the static susceptibility. So this is a thermodynamic derivative of del rho over del nu. And d is going to be the diffusion constant in a second. So this is why I've picked this particular decomposition. And then as we go to shorter distances or shorter times, then we have higher order in gradient terms that can start to be important. But to leading order, this is the only term we need to care about. To solve the system, what we do is we decompose it in linear perturbations in plane waves. Since we have translation symmetry, we can do that, translation and rotation symmetry. So now we'll be looking at the density fluctuation delta rho. Then there's a well-known procedure to compute the retarded Green's function of the system when we perturb it with a small variation of, say, the chemical potential. And from there, we extract the density density retarded Green's function in Fourier space. It takes this form, i chi d k squared in the numerator, and then in the denominator, uh, there's this particular structure, omega plus i d k squared. Now, we see that there's a pole in the denominator, which is of the form omega equals minus i d k squared plus subleading terms. So this order k to the fourth term, they would come from this higher order in gradient terms, which I didn't write. So to leading order, the dispersion relation is purely, quadrat is purely imaginary and quadratic. And now when we transform back to real space, we get something which looks like this, where we see that uh, the fluctuations of density are exponentially damped over long distances. So this is diffusion. This is exactly what we mean by diffusion. Any questions on this? So th that's basically the, the systems that I will be describing in the rest of the talk, they will all obey this kind of dynamics in the deep IR limit. Uh, sorry, Blaise, just for the record, I yes. thought that fixed law is what you call the constitutive relation. Okay. Maybe I might have been flippant about that. I'll look it up and change it if I need to. But yeah, okay. So conservation equation and constitutive relation. All right. So of course there are limits on the applicability of hydro of the hydrodynamic description. And the uh, most obvious limit is the one that is related to the establishment of local equilibrium, which I've already uh, mentioned before. That is, we need local equilibrium to, to be established. So we only expect hydrodynamics to be valid at sufficiently late times and long wavelengths compared to the local equi equilibration time and the local equilibration length. Now there's uh, a simple argument that was made by Hartman, Hartnell and Mahajan a couple of years back. And it goes as follows. Generally for any microscopic system, you expect that if you look at some operator and you evolve it with time, with the Hamiltonian, you know, for instance, some spin chain, uh, what you will see is that the size of the operator will grow linearly in time just by commuting it with the Hamiltonian. So this linear in T growth of operator, you can think of it as defining for you some kind of effective light cone velocity because you've got this, this straight line here, which you know, it tells you that whatever you do, I mean, you need to stay within this cone. Now, obviously, if you have some Lorentz invariance in your system, then you expect this velocity to be the speed of light. But this, these considerations they also apply to non-relativistic systems or systems without boosts. And then you would think of this velocity as maybe some kind of Lib Robinson velocity, butterfly velocity, Fermi velocity. You can be pretty much uh, agnostic about, about this for the sake of the argument. So let's just say that there's some velocity, some fundamental velocity in the system that bounds to how fast operators can grow. But then on the other hand, we also saw that at very late time, if we think about this case, this, this simple case of a conserved density, um, there's this exponential damping right here. And this is basically telling you that diffusion defines this other line, which is a parabola. And so diffusion will be valid at sufficiently late time and, and length. And this you can see because at some point there'll be a crossing point between these two lines. And for sure, what you don't want to allow is for a diffusive transport to take you outside of this effective light cone. 
So this uh, intersection of these two lines, which is kind of blurry because it's not very precise at this stage, it places some uh, lower bound on the time or the length at which hydrodynamic diffusion can possibly be valid. And this you can rewrite just using this equation x equals square root of dt as uh, some upper bound on the diffusivity. And there's a twiddle here because again, I mean, exactly where hydrodynamic will break down is a bit blurry and this is sort of giving you some rough estimate of where you might expect it to happen. So what we'd like would be yes. to understand exactly how this plays out in concrete systems. We'd like to, you know, understand better what this V might be and, uh, you know, what, what controls this equilibration time. And this is what we'll do in this talk you, on, a, on a set of specific examples. Uh, sorry, sorry, Blaise. Yes. I, I think I, I just didn't understand. So, so what's the physical relation between the? So, if I wanted to make this diffusive approximation of, at the too early times, uh, what would go wrong with this uh, operator growth? So I, I just didn't understand. So you would you would find that operators can grow faster than linear in time, faster that you can you know make them grow I if you commute them with some Hamiltonian. And, 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 and that's a general bound coming from QFT axioms or that's... Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, and of but course they... Can you make it precise? So I guess I, I know what the size of an operator is if uh, I'm looking at the spin train, but... Uh, yeah, exactly. So the, the whole question is... What is this? Yeah, exactly. So that's the whole question. How do you make this precise? You can make it precise if you have some spin chain and you know exactly what the operators are. But if for more general systems, then it becomes a bit complicated. And in particular, identifying what this V might be, this is something that is not entirely clear. But, but if you don't know how to define the size of the operator exactly in general, uh, how do you know it's linear? I mean, what does the bound refer to? Um, Or it's only been made for spin -trans. No, I thought, I thought that uh, if you use OTOC, in principle, you can define it if it has the right shape, if you wish, if the correlator has the right shape. That's how you define it using yeah. uh, the butterfly velocity. So right. you can yes. define it in a sense, but the question is you don't know how to calculate it in most systems and find out I, what it is. I see. I, I'm sorry, because I, I didn't follow the uh, the literature at all. So, so, so what's the definition of this? Uh, 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 upper there's bound. no, there's no definition. I mean, there's no precise definition. This is not a bound that's been proved, mm -hmm. right? So this is some kind of more general expectation than you know whatever your system is. Uh, system, the, the you know operators cannot grow arbitrarily fast with time. Okay. okay thanks. And uh, yeah, for instance. Sorry, so for relativistic theories, this is clear. What's Less clear, yeah. of course, is that this works for non-relativistic theories like Lee Robinson, et cetera. Well, but then you, you know, based on, on some examples, at least you know that in some controlled examples, this is how things work out. Right, but, right. Yeah, right. like I said, there's, no, there's certainly no general quantum field theory proof of a bound of this kind. Yeah. Sorry, Blaise, uh, by, yeah. by size of the operator, you mean size of the support domain somehow? Is that how I should think of it in QFT or? Or you can think of it as, yeah, I guess so. Or think of a spin chain. If you take uh, one of the operators for the spins and then you commute it with the Hamiltonian, the operator will grow. You have more and more sites in the operator. That's why I'm thinking of the sites. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. In, Again, in no, none of this is super precise, right? I, I don't want to okay. convey the, the wrong impression. Let's just say that there's some general expectation that you can't you can't diffuse things away to uh, arbitrarily short lengths. From my perspective, this is the main message, and this is what I'd like to understand better in a set of examples where we can actually compute all of these things. So, are you are you doing a small, perhaps unjustified, but but physically uh, still instructive extrapolation because diffusion is not supposed to hold for short times. Like 
Is that it is, we know we as I'm going to explain this a bit more uh, very very shortly, but so we know that diffusive transport cannot be correct at arbitrarily short times and wavelengths. So something must happen, and there are many things that can happen. And uh, but but yeah, let me maybe go on with the talk, and we can get back to this issue later on. I think. Can I? Yes. Uh, let me let me yeah. still ask a question. I understand you want to go on. Is can I use this as a definition of the equilibration time? Just your plot. Is that not like you have, uh, a, you have diffusion? Yes and no. Let, let me, I'll give you a more precise definition of the equilibration time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this, this plot is really some kind of, uh, it, it's really schematic. It tells you schematically what we might expect to happen. And the question is, how does it happen exactly? And what's, you know, can we identify what these scales are? And for certain controlled systems, we can. Generally, it's harder. Right. Okay, thanks. All right, there's another limit on the applicability of diffusion, which relates directly to the first question Balt asked, which is that, again, this is a series expansion in, in, in gradients. So in Fourier space, we expect the dispersion relation to be a series in even powers of k, order k squared, then k to the fourth, k to the sixth, and so on. And there's nothing that prevents us from computing all of these higher order terms. And the natural question is, does the series converge? This is really hard to answer in general because in general, we, don't, we are not able to compute all of these uh, contributions to the dispersion relation to arbitrarily high order. But in holography, in gauge gravity duality, this is something that we can do relatively easily. It's conceptually straightforward, then sometimes it takes a bit of computational power, but there's no there's no obstacle uh, of, of there's no conceptual obstacle to doing it. And indeed this has been been done by a number of people and groups, either in real space and in Fourier space. So in real space what people computed, so Heller and collaborators, is the gradient expansion of the constitutive relation. And in Fourier space what you compute is the value of these coefficients omega 2n. In Fourier space, so this is all this is all for linearized hydrodynamics, by the way. In Fourier space, what Ben Withers showed a couple of years back is that uh, you can compute the radius of convergence of the series that corresponds to the shear diffusive mode of the Reisner Nordstrom black brain in four-dimensional anti-decita. And when you compute this uh, radius of convergence, the way you compute it is you compute all of these omega 2n's and then you take the ratio and you determine the radius of convergence of the series in this way. But then what we observed is that if you track the location of the shear diffusive mode in the complex plane as a function of purely imaginary k now, so this is the subtlety, this is the new statement. Usually we think of k as some real number, but as we well know from uh, complex analysis, when we, you want to know uh, the properties of uh, the convergence of some series, then you also need to look at complex uh, singularities in the complex plane. So in this plot, Ben Withers was computing the imaginary part of the pole, of the frequency of the pole, versus purely imaginary wave vector, purely imaginary k, tracking it for this value of k. And then what you observed is that there's a collision as a certain critical value of k with some other mode of the complex plane, which is here in black. So this collision right here tells you that at this stage, you cannot possibly be approximating your system with diffusion because diffusion would only capture a single pole. So this guy and not that guy. So your description, your effective description has to break down here. And moreover, what he saw is that if he plotted the series of the dispersion relation for the shear diffusive mode, so, so this object right here that he had previously determined, on top of the exact location of the pole, then what you see is that the, the series converges up to this point. So the statement is that the radius of convergence of the series coincides with a collision with a, another pole, which you know, comes from whatever mic microscopic physics is also lying around uh, in the complex plane, possibly for complex value of k. So this is, this is a bit more precise statement because now we have some k -ek and so some local equilibration lengths and as well as some omega -ek right here.
Is the statement clear? Because then a lot of the talk will revolve around the same type of considerations. Sorry, which precise other poll is he referring to? Which what? Um, which other poll? Uh, what does this black line represent? Ah, uh, so you know you're computing. So here, what he's computing is com he's computing the transverse momentum retarded Green's function for that particular system. Now, this retarded Green's function has a whole tower of poles, and all of them are gapped except for one. The one which is not gapped is the hydrodynamic diffusion pole. So it's it's this guy that we're talking about, and it's this. This one here in the plot. Now, further um, deeper down in the lower half frequency plane, there's a whole tower of these black modes, which you, you see are gapped at k equals zero, right? So all of these are non hydrodynamic, and a rough statement would have been the hydrodynamic approximation is valid as long as this particular gapless pole, the diffusion pole, stays well away from any of the gapped poles. The gapped poles, they're the, the remnants of the microscopic physics of your system. So in, in this case, they're basically fixed by the UV CFT. You can think of it as, this way. Is this a blaze? Is this a numerical or it's... Uh, yes, it's, it's all numerical. numerical. Okay. It's all numerical. And like this uh, green line, I think he computed like 40 or 50 terms, something like that. You can get the first couple terms analytically, but then it rapidly becomes. Then you've got this whole set of nested integrals, and you can't really do anything with that. Uh, bless. Yeah. This singularity in the complex plane is is a collision of the two poles. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. But as a function of purely imag imaginary k. Mm -hmm. All right, so there have been further confirmations that these pictures appear to be correct, at least you know, in holographic systems, uh, further studies, arguments for the above, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for the purposes of my talk, the imp another important statement is that at this stage, the, the precise location of the breakdown of hydrodynamics in these systems, this is entirely controlled by microscopic details of the system. I really need to know the entire system before I can I can I cannot predict for you a priori where this is going to be happening. I need I need the entire information on the system. So this is nice. I mean, you know, it's what it is, but we could ask are there cases where we can determine the where hydrodynamic breaks down without needing uh, any any detailed knowledge of the underlying microscopic theory? And what I want to show you today is that the answer is yes, provided there's some kind of hierarchy of scales. And I'll give you examples using holography and also SYK. There are two main classes that I want to talk about. One is when there's a symmetry, which is weakly broken. So there's some irrelevant deformation in the infrared because it's irrelevant and the symmetry breaking dies off. And, and so that provides one class of such examples. And the other class of examples is when there aren't any weakly broken symmetry, but we're near an ADS2 fixed point. So let me talk about the first class. Please, of systems. Sorry. Yes. Can I ask about your the slides before this? Yep. Uh, still. So you have an, a K ek, an equilibrium. K. Is this, um, uh, I guess you it's, it's complex. Um, yes, in but, this case, uh, it's purely imaginary. Yeah, I that particular system, it's purely imaginary, but now what we understand is that in general, in holography, this is going to be complex. And are you, is this some kind of equilibration velocity that you want to, do you want to argue uh, that this is some, some, some velocity? Let, let me, let me postpone the answer to that question. But okay. so can I relate? At this stage, there's no velocity. Okay, let, let me partially answer the question for that particular system, even though, um, here there's a collision that there's no there's no propagating mode there's no mode that has some dispersion relation omega equals v times k in the system anywhere uh -huh. I but see. 
uh, just anticipating a little bit, of course, you could always define some velocity by, you know, dividing um, the, the frequency by the, the critical frequency by the critical wave vector. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, but then how does this result of Ben, um, how is it relevant to what you showed on the previous slide? I guess I'm missing that. It is, it is not, right. I mean, it isn't yet. Okay, okay, very good. Then I didn't miss much. Yeah, yeah. It, it will be. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so let's talk about the case, the case where, uh, when there's a weakly broken symmetry. This is from some older results. So maybe I'll try to go through this uh, a bit quickly so we can get to the ADS2 part, but yes, in any case, stop me at any time with more questions. So this is the kind of system we're looking at. This is Einstein gravity plus a negative cosmological constant in a four dimensional bulk. The dimension has, is not important at all. And then we have this extra set of scalar fields. And the nice thing about this theory is that it, ha it has uh, analytical solutions, analytical black hole solutions, which were worked out first by people uh, in Orsay, Christos Charmuzis and collaborators, and then revived by Thomas Andrade and Ben Withers in the context of holography a little bit later on. This is what the ansatz looks like. It's very simple. And you can see that this is just a small modification of Schwarzschild uh, due to this parameter M right here. Now, the way that M enters, we see these are scalars and we fix them to be linear in X. X is the spatial boundary direction. So this is an ansatz. These are not the only solutions to this system, but this is just a solution. Because of this very simple ansatz, then you can see that automatically translations are broken because this is not invariant under translations. And how much they're broken will depend on the size of M intuitively, that makes sense. But also since the Einstein equations only involve gradients of these scalars, they're massless, right? Uh, then everything remains homogeneous. And this is what allows for this very simple solution to be found. And that has been a real workhorse of applied holography for the past few years. Interestingly, since we have this new parameter to play with, now the temperature uh, has some dependence, right? It's not like in Schwarzschild where the temperature and the horizon radius uh, are zero, are completely fixed in terms of one another. Now there's this extra scale M, so we can have a non-trivial RG flow. And I'll talk about it uh, in the second part of the talk. Right now I'll focus on the high temperature regime. So when you can think of M as a small perturbation around Schwarzschild ADS. So at high temperatures, because M is only a weak perturbation around Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild, then we expect that translations are weakly broken. And so momentum slowly relaxes at some rate gamma, which means that we have the following effective description at sufficiently large scales. This is the usual momentum conservation equation. So time derivative of momentum plus some spatial derivative of uh, CS squared. So CS will be the sound velocity times fluctuations of energy, except that now, since I want momentum to relax, I've turned on by hand uh, some relaxation term on the right-hand side. So obviously, if you were to solve this without the spatial dependence, then pi would go like e to the minus gamma t. So indeed, momentum relaxes in the system. Now we add to this energy conservation, which is not affected in the system, right? There's no time dependence anywhere, so energy is conserved. And then when I combine these two equations by taking a time derivative of the first one and then substituting with this one, I get a second order equation for momentum, which looks like this. And the question is, you know, let's check whether that provides an actual accurate description of our system. Now, for sufficiently high T, we can also compute what the momentum relaxation rate is. I'm not gonna uh, tell you how we do that, but it's not, it's not very complicated. What you find is that the uh, momentum relaxation rate is proportional to M squared over T. So this is much smaller than T when T is greater than M. And since here we're thinking about a CFT, which is weakly perturbed by this translation breaking operator, we, we intuitively, we know that typical excitations will live at scales of order temperature. So since for large M over T, 
uh, this rate is much smaller than t, then we expect that this is going to be a good effective description for sufficiently short and short wavelengths, uh, sorry, sufficiently large wavelengths and large and late times. So what we do now is to test this against, a, you know, this is an effective description, but we actually know the entire microscopic system, so we can just check if this works. The first step is to go to Fourier uh, space. So this, then the equation looks, now looks like this. And we solve this. This should give us the motion of holes in the system, provided that uh, omega, k, and gamma are sufficiently small compared to some UV scale, which here is simply temperature. And this is actually true for sufficiently large m over t, uh, small m over t. So even here, one half is enough, which is pretty remarkable. You can see that uh, so the, the lines are the plots of this, uh, is a plot of that equation. And the dots are the exact numerical results solving for the linearized Einstein equations in this black brain background. And you can see that the two match very well. What happens is in this plot is that there's a crossover between diffusion of energy and weakly relaxing momentum and propagation. So this goes like this. You solve for the modes, you expand them at small k, you find that one mode is diffusive and looks like this. This is energy diffusion. In a system where momentum relaxes, then energy is still going to diffuse. And then the other mode you find by taking the small k limit is this mode. So it has a gap at gamma, which lets you uh, identify it as the weekly momentum relaxing mode, and then some k-squared correction. So this is at small k. So you get some dispersion relation like this. Now, if you look at the exact solution, you track it to larger k, okay, then you see that the two modes collide here. And then they will pick up some real part right here in the bottom. And eventually, for sufficiently large k, they're propagating with a velocity, which is the sound velocity in the system where you don't break translations. The reason why this happens, again, you can understand on intuitive grounds. If you're looking at scales k, which are bigger than the momentum relaxation scale, but still, of course, smaller than the UV scale, then somehow your excitations don't really, haven't really yet noticed that momentum relaxes. So the excitations are those of the system without any breaking of translations with a weak perturbation. So this is just going to be sound. On the other hand, if you go to the longest wavelengths, so very small k compared to gamma, then there, the system is really probing the fact that momentum is relaxing. And so instead, you'll have uh, the, the effective theory is going to be energy diffusion and momentum relaxation. Sorry, Blaise. Can I ask a trivial question? Yes. Uh, your Lagrangian had an axion symmetry, if I remember correctly, right? So phi to phi plus A is a symmetry. So your background still leaves unbroken uh, a yes. combined action plus translation symmetry. That's right. This is why the this is why the solution is homogeneous. In fact, it's because there you have a U one cross U one. There's, there's a U one cross U one, like you're saying, and it's broken down to the diagonal U one. Right. So there is some conserved uh, charge associated to this which should replace momentum, I would think, no? Um, right, so when you look, so this manifests itself in, when you look at the gauge invariant perturbations of the system, then normally momentum would be uh, associated to Tx perturbations of the metric. And now you see that these combine with phi x perturbations of the metric. Mm -hmm. uh, Bless, I have a probably related question. Yes. Uh, this solution cannot interpret it as a spontaneous broken of translation. So don't you have some no. bolts on bosons? No, no, here it's, it's not spontaneous uh, because so if you just run through the usual holographic dictionary for a massless scalar in ADS4, then you would find that uh, the fall offs near the UV boundary go like R to the zero and R to the three, if the boundary is R is R going to zero. And so here, uh, as usual, the source mode is going to be the non-normalizable -normal mode, and this is the R to the zero term. 
And so it's this guy. So here we're turning on a pure source term in the background, no verb. And because the scalars are massless, we're also not in this window where we can use alternate quantization. So this is always explicit breaking of translations. Great. Yeah. But there, there are generalizations of this where you can make this into a, a uh, spontaneous mm -hmm. breaking of translations. But yeah, I let me not get into that. But somehow, Blaze, it looks more like a deformation of the symmetry, but not a breaking of the symmetry. I'm a little. Uh... Well, your original translation is, uh, original translations are broken, right? Yeah, but they are replaced by another unbroken symmetry. I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how momentum, much. Yeah. Let me put it this way: the momentum operator itself still remains well defined and is conjugate to. Uh, delta GTX. And so that is broken, whatever you do. Even though there's some combination that is mm -hmm. that remains unbroken, this is not your physical momentum of the system. Uh, Blaz, let me put it uh, differently. Um, uh, each of the phi i's carries a charge uh, because, of course, they're axioms. Uh, but you're working in the, in the grand canonical ensemble. So the combined symmetry that remains that Costas is talking about of course, could be there, but here in the grand canonical ensemble, it's not relevant for your discussion. And therefore, as you're saying, as mm. far as momentum is concerned, it's, this is broken, and that's that's the end of the story. I don't know if it helps either, but um, you could uh, always turn on a double trace deformation on the boundary, and then you can make the breaking spontaneous. I think that relates maybe more to Emilian's question. But you need a double trace deformation. And Hodge, sorry, and also you need to Hodge dualize the scalars. All right, let, let, let me not get into that. I, I think it's taking us too far away from the, the focus of the talk. All right, so we've got this effective picture and we see that it works, that it matches well the, um, you know, what, what happens when you actually calculate things. Um, now we can be a bit precise about this equi equilibration scale. So let's go back, we'll, again, let me remind you, we're looking at the solutions of this equation, which are simply this. And then it's clear that there's a non-analyticity where the radicon vanishes. And the, a uh, really nice thing that happens is that since here we were in a regime where gamma is small, the momentum relaxation rate is small compared to the UV scale, then that means that you know any corrections to these equations, and of course there are corrections, are suppressed by you know a ratio of gamma over lambda UV. So these simple solutions describe very well, this is what I'm plotting here, they describe very well the actual dynamics of the system, the exact dynamics of the system. And so in particular, the non-analyticity here describes very well as well, is a very accurate approximation to the actual breakdown of uh, this description, the breakdown of diffusive hydrodynamics. So here, the only thing I've done is um, uh, determined where this thing vanishes. So that's K collision is gamma over two CS. And then evaluate what the frequency is at the, that particular value of momentum, which is gamma over two. And then you, uh, the equilibration and uh, time scale and length scale are just the absolute values of this. So this is this statement. So here, what we see is that in contrast to what I was showing you uh, for the shear diffusion mode here, where in order to approximate the exact location of the pole, Ben Withers needed to compute a very large number of terms here because there was no hierarchy of scales. So there was nothing that would suppress, let's say the K to the four term compared to the K squared term at you know once K grows beyond a certain value. So you really needed to get all of these terms in order to get a good match between the series expansion and the actual exact numerics. But here in contrast, because we're working in this regime of very small gamma, then corrections to those expressions are suppressed and you can get away with just this simple description. With, and this is what is giving us a lot of control. And allows us an analytical determination of the convergence radius. 
it's really due to this hierarchy of scales. This is also not a hydrodynamic expression. If you were to, if I, I could do something different, I could solve the system order by order in K, exactly like Ben Withers had done, and I would de then I would determine the uh, order K to the fourth, K to the sixth corrections to the dispersion relation in the hydrodynamic limit. And then I would see the same thing that he did, that is I would have some match all the way up to the collision point, and then the series would diverge. So here, what the hierarchy of scale between gamma and the, the UV scale allows me to do is resum all the uh, higher order contributions into this expression. So this is some, doing something different than the usual hydrodynamic expansion in K. This is a resummation for sufficiently small gamma. And this is also why when we take the limit where k is greater than gamma, then we get these propagating modes, and they also describe very, they, they continue to describe very well the system. Now, even though, and like I said, even though energy diffusion can be augmented to incorporate slowly relaxing momentum, we can get an EFT that captures both of these process, dynamical processes, then uh, it still formally breaks down at omega x and kx. The, the series would diverge. Yet what this, these considerations give us, they tell us that the diffusivity is simply expressed in terms of the ratio of a velocity squared over a length over a time scale, over a, a relaxation rate. And these are directly related to the motion of poles in the complex frequency plane. So then it's a simple game to rewrite everything in terms of some omega x and kx. And this is again valid when there's this hierarchy of scales. Now what I can do is I can define a vx, which is omega x over kx. This is my choice. And which in this case is proportional to the sound velocity. So the main message here is that when there's a, hier a hierarchy of scale like this and the symmetry is weakly broken, then you can always obtain a simple relation between the diffusivity and the local equilibration time scales and some characteristic velocity. And these all correspond to physical excitations of the system. But somehow this is, this is a special case. We'd like to know more generally when no symmetry is weakly broken, but we still have a hierarchy of scales. Can we, can we get something there? And so this is the second part of the talk. So maybe let me pause here and take any questions before moving on. So you basically, you have this omega squared term, right? Which does all the work. This one? Yeah. Is yeah. there, so this is your, your non-hydrodynamic term basically, but from yes. the hydro, from the hydrodynamic perspective, it's, there's no way to, to, to get such a term, right? Or to incorporate it into the hydrodynamic framework. Oh, because it seems to be something that you could try to say more generally that there are no you you could right. if you if you included higher order terms and gradients in the constitutive relation then you would get you, you would be allowed to write down time derivatives as well uh -huh. and then you would get some omega dependence i see but um it's one thing to view this as a hydrodynamic expansion omega plus k squared plus omega squared etc where the higher order terms in omega and k you treat as smaller than the subleading terms, than, than the, the terms with lower order. It's another thing to say, let me solve for that thing equals zero and trust the action that this gives me an accurate location of the, of the poles. Typically, this isn't true. I see. That is, I can always write the denominator of the retarded Green's function as a frequency and wave vector expansion. And solve that. So, you know, I'll get some quadratic or cubic or quartic polynomial in frequencies, and then I'll get one, two, three, four poles. Mm -hmm. But usually you can only trust the location of the gapless pole because the gaps, the gaps of the gapped poles, uh, they're not small compared to anything. There's no, there's no, unless there's no control parameter that makes these gaps small so that you can reliably capture them in your effective description. 
I see. And here things work out because we are working in a regime where gamma is small. Okay, very good. Thanks. Yeah, that was useful. All right, so now let's look at the case where there's no, let's look at a case where there's no hierarchy and there's no weakly broken symmetry, but there's still a hierarchy of scales. And the simplest thing to do is to take temperature to be very low in exactly the same system. So for very low temperatures, translations are strongly broken. Since translations are strongly broken, what we expect from everything I've just told you is that we will only be left with diffusion of energy. And indeed, this is what happens. Moreover, so uh, let me maybe go back to this slide. You can see right here from the expression of temperature that T goes to zero when R zero is equal to M over square root of six. This is exactly analogous to what happens in Rice and Nordstrom. So that means that there's going to be some uh, extremal radius with some ADS2 near extremal geometry. So you can check that explicitly from the solution. This is no, this, this isn't difficult. So there's an ADS2 cross R2 in the IR, which means that there's a uh, finite entropy left at zero temperature in the ground state. And this is why when you go to zero temperature, the diffusivity remains non-zero because there are still states that you can, uh, they can use to disperse energy. So this is uh, somehow ADS2 horizons are a bit special because they have this feature of having a non-zero diffusivity. Another feature is that at small temperatures, because of ADS2 cross R2, there's an emergent SL2 across SL2 R symmetry. And then when you compute retarded Green's function in the uh, ADS2 cross R2 background, then you will find that the IR retarded Green's function takes this nice form uh, that involves ratios of gamma functions and operator dimensions in the IR, which take this simple form. So this is again very nice because we usually don't have this, this amount of control over the system. We usually cannot solve for the uh, frequency and momentum dependence of the IR retarded Green's function exactly. And here we can do that because there's this emergent extra symmetry. Now, these uh, IR retarded Green's function have poles where the numerator of uh, the retarded Green's function uh, vanishes because the, the gamma functions diverges where, where they had zeros. So if we work this out, we see that in the IR retarded Green's function, there's an infinite tower of gapped IR modes, which are controlled by uh, multiples of 2 pi t with some multiplication factor, which is n, some integer, uh, offset by the dimension of the operator at k equals 0. So for the specific case at hand, uh, at hand here, delta of k equals 0 is 1 half plus 3 halves equals 2. So we expect that the first gapped mode is going to be at minus i 4 pi t and then minus i 6 pi t, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sorry, Blaise. Yeah. Are there any poles that come from zeros of the gamma functions in the denominator? No, this would give you zeros. So actually, yes, there are zeros as well that are given by those. No, I'm not talking about the, the poles functions. of the gammas, but uh, the gammas have zeros also, right, on the complex plane. So do you get any poles from the zeros yeah, of the gammas? No, I don't huh? think they have zeros. They, they don't? don't have zeros. They only have poles. Ah, yes. OK. All right. Yeah. So to recap, this IR retarded Green's function has poles that come from the zeros of this gamma function in the numerator. And it has zeros that come from the zeros of this gamma function in the denominator. And when you set k to 0, most of them cancel out. So actually, this is only true when k is kept non-zero. So all right, so this is the IR retarded Green's function computed directly in the infrared ADS2 cross R2. Now, as we well know, in applied ads -CFT, when you want to compute the UV retarded Green's function, then you need to match the IR geometry to the UV geometry. And, and then there's no, there's no guarantee that the poles will still be, the poles of the UV retarded Green's function will be those of the IR retarded Green's functions. Because of these matching coefficients, they will shift things a bit. Here, though, it turns out that things still work out in the sense that when we compute the pole spectrum in the full UV state, the full UV uh, uh, space-time, 
then we see that there's a tower of gapped modes, which are these black dots right here. So here I'm plotting minus the imaginary part of frequency over 2 pi t. The first one is at 4 pi t, 6 pi t, 8 pi t, and so on. And these coincide precisely with the prediction from the IR retarded Quinn's function. So this isn't completely obvious that it should have worked out like this. And then on top of that, there's a gapless mode, which is that of energy diffusion. So it's, it's this guy right here. So this is the pole spectrum. Then you see there's a red line, and then there's something going on here when uh, these poles cross one another. Um, maybe observe that these IR poles, they have a very weak K dependence. This is because it's completely suppressed at low T compared to the K dependence of the, diffuser, the diffusive mode. It's there, but when you zoom out, you just cannot resolve it by I. Now, what we've done is we've computed analytically uh, the approximate location of this pole in the scaling limit omega over the t over the k squared of order lambda, where lambda is a bookkeeping parameter, which is small, for sufficiently small t. This isn't the hydro limit, right? The hydro limit would have been omega over the k squared much less than t. Here we're doing omega over the t. So when you do this analytical computation, this is the approximate uh, 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 dispersion relation you find. And this is what I've plotted in red. And so you see that not only does it work very well at low k, as we might have expected, it also continues to work all the way to the first crossing with uh, one of the gap poles and even beyond, which is pretty remarkable. And Moreover, that is going to be pretty much suppressed compared to this. So you can you know, forget about it. And so what we see is that this crossing, they actually happen basically at the location of the IR poles. So minus I2 pi t and plus 2. Because remember, uh, this 2 comes from delta of 0 for energy diffusion. And then k squared, because the diffusive form really works very well all the way up to here, k squared is just given by inverting the diffusive dispersion relation, setting the frequency to be omega n, which is what we do here. So somehow in the system, the uh, corrections to the diffusion dispersion relation are completely suppressed at sufficiently low temperature. And that allows us to resolve where this feature of the hydrodynamic mode crossing the first gap mode is analytically. Now, there's a subtlety about what's going on here. So let me zoom a little bit. This is a zooming on this crossing. This is the hydro mode, and this is the first gap mode. And you see that actually they don't collide. There's an avoided crossing. And this isn't an artifact of the numerics. At any finite non-zero temperature, there is going to be a small gap right here. So all of these crossings that you see here, they're not collisions as a function of real k. They're avoided crossings of this kind. And it turns out that in the limit of low temperature and in this scaling limit that I was mentioning here, we can also compute perturbatively the dispersion relation around this crossing point. It looks something like this. I've put the expressions just for reference to show you that we can actually compute what these things are. And I've plotted what they are with these red lines. And you see that these analytical approximations give us a very good, uh, a very good approximation to the exact numerics. So there is really an avoided crossing at any non-zero t. Instead, the collision happens as a function of complex momentum. And this is what is displayed on this plot. So this is the imaginary part of omega on the uh, vertical axis, and now the real part of omega on the uh, horizontal axis as a function of complex momentum. Here, what we do is we fix the phase to some critical value here, and then we vary the modulus. And you see that when we do that, the poles collide. Now the phase vanishes at low t. So this complex collision is getting closer and closer to the real axis as t goes to zero, which 
is um, exactly the same statement as saying there's this gap of the avoided crossing becomes vanishingly small at, as t goes to zero. Uh, sorry, Blaise. So what controls uh, uh, the, this gap? Um, what combination controls the gap? Is this phi k? So yeah, it's the phase, exactly. I see. And the phase, I mean, I'll get to this in a second. The phase is, it appears to be controlled by the dimension of the operator, of the IR operator, by this delta of k. Let me get back to this in a sec. And uh, again, we can, so we can compute the uh, local equilibration length and the local equilibration time by the knowledge of where this collision is happening. And this is given here. All of these analytical approximations work very well. So here Sorry, again please. are some. Uh, yeah. The previous plot, this, so all these lines are added to what fixed uh, imaginary k or? Uh... Fixed, fixed phase. And we vary the modulus. Are you ready the modulus? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So uh, here in these three plots, I'm plotting the phase, the equilibration length, the equilibration time, uh, numerically determined. These are the black dots, and then the analytical approximations, which are here. So again, things work very well, as you can see. This is all to this is simply to demonstrate that. So. Because we have this agreement between the numerics and the analytical approximation all the way to the avoided crossing, then that means that we can trust this dispersion relation all the way to the breakdown of hydrodynamics. And so in particular, it directly yields this relation between the diffusivity, the equilibration time, and the equilibration length, simply by inverting the diffusive dispersion relation here and setting omega equals omega x and k equals k x. This is a bit remarkable because it means that we've found in the case of these ADS2 space times, a relation between some hydrodynamic data, which characterizes the dynamics here for very small k, and some data which marks the breakdown of hydrodynamics and which usually comes from microscopic details of the system. Except that here, this is determined by features that can be worked out in the IR theory. Because remember this poles, so this frequency where hydrodynamic is breaking down, this is simply the frequency of a gapped IR mode. And this we can determine without knowing the UV theory. This, it just comes from this retarded Green's function where we only needed to use the ADS to COSAR2 metric in order to get it. So this is a pretty nice feature of ADS2 horizons. And uh, so this plot is a, a proof that this relation works, right? It goes to unity as we lower temperature. It works better and better. So this was one example. And uh, I mean, you, there were questions about exactly what the symmetries were, et cetera. So and there's this global symmetry related to the axons. So you may be worried, is this a good example, uh, UV complete, et cetera. So we repeated exactly the same thing with the Rice and Nordstrom black brain, which also has an ADS2 cross R2 in the near extremal region. Uh, except this time, uh, you can't really do any analytical analysis. It's, yeah, it's too difficult to, to, to solve the equations. So we just did numerics. But exactly the same uh, features were observed in both sectors where we have a diffusive mode. So for Rice and Nordstrom, there's an energy diffusion mode and there's a shear momentum diffusion mode. And for both of these modes, we see that the equilibration scale, omega x, is given by 2 pi t times delta, the dimension of the least irrelevant operator. So this is what this plot is showing. We also see, and in this case, it's interesting, I should, I should specify that these are for two different values of delta. In, in one case, we still have delta equals two, like in the axon case. And in one case, we have delta equals one for transverse momentum. So it's, this seems to be robust for these ADS2 systems. You just need to know what delta is, and then you can predict the equilibration time scale. Now, if we look at the phase, the temperature dependence is different and appears to be compatible with t to the delta minus one half. So again, this appears to be determined by IR data. And finally, this is plotting this relation, kx squared d over omega x, 
that I was mentioning before. So the diffusivity is simply related to the equilibration time and equilibration length as t goes to zero. Okay, so that's it for the holographic part. And then I, if, if I still have a little time, I can tell you about SYK, if that's okay. I think we have sure, like, you have a, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, we have like 10 minutes or so. Yeah, that's plenty enough time. Okay. Good, so SYK. I won't give a long introduction to SYK because- uh, maybe, Sorry, Blaise, before you yeah. go on, can I have a quick question about the, the yes. previous? So, uh, so in your plot of the poles um, for, for the first system, the, um, did I understand correctly that the, the reason that uh, there are like sort of parallel lines like this was be because uh, somehow uh, the, the UV of the theory had sort of the same position of the gap poles? No, not quite. This not is quite. because the, um, these poles that you uh, can work out from the IR retarded Green's function have a much weaker K dependence than uh, the diffusion pole here. So uh, it's, the, the K dependence is further suppressed by some powers of T over M. And since we're working in the limit where T over M is very small, then when you zoom out on the plot, you cannot see the K dependence. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so SYK. Uh, I won't go over all the reasons why SYK is interesting for AD, near ADS2 holography, but this is, it is very interesting. This is a model that was um, de, um, studied by Sajdef and Ye in 93 and then revisited by Kitaev in, in 2015 which consists of the, of the following. You have, um, let's say, a dot with uh, a number of fermions with random, uh, so originally four to four couplings, but then uh, you can generalize this to all to all coupling. This is this ji1 uh, to iq. And so all of these couplings, you give them some random distribution. So there's no notion of locality at any of these dots because of the random couplings of fermions to one another. However, uh, it was uh, soon worked out after the uh, Kitaev talks that you could do a higher dimensional generalization by putting several of these dots on a line and then allowing couplings between these dots. So this basically is some kind of hopping term between each dot. There's a J and there's a J prime. The J is the self interaction at each site and J prime is some kind of hopping term from one site to the next. So this is called the, the SYK chain because this is going to be one dimensional. And we expect that energy diffuses as well uh, at long distances in this kind of model. Now, also what was noticed is that in the limit of infinite coupling, J and J prime, there's an emergent reparameterization invariance that suggests a duality to near ADS to gravity. Now, in general, the model is hard to solve. But when you take Q to infinity, so remember, Q is the number of fermions that couple to one another. So you take the, 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 the limit where all fermions couple, couple to each other. Then you can solve the model analytically for all coupling strengths. This is an amazing result. This is in this paper by uh, Choi, uh, Sarozzi, and Meze. That's from, I think, last October or November. I can't remember. So. I won't go through the details of the paper, I just use their results. They get an exact expression for all values of J and temperature for the energy retarded Green's function. That is uh, you know, an extremely impressive result. So then once you have that, you can just beat, beat it to death and study it to death. And in particular, what they did is they plotted the spectrum of poles. This is the imaginary part of frequency. P is their momentum and V is their proxy for beta J. V goes to one is uh, beta J goes to infinity. So very low temperature, infinite coupling strength. And what we see is that as uh, you go to lower and lower temperatures and uh, stronger and stronger interactions, 
there's a very clear analogy to these kind of plots that I was just showing you. And in fact, these are exactly the same plots. So the dynamics in, um, at low temperatures in SYK are really uh, qualitatively similar to those in ADS2. There are differences here. Uh, the, the, these are not avoided crossings. They're actual collisions, which they didn't depict on their plot. So you know there are details that change because there are details that are slightly different when you go away from the deep IR limit in SYK and in ADS2. But they're qualitatively extremely similar. So now what we've done is uh, we've reproduced their results and extracted the local equ equilibration scales, exactly like we're doing for Rice and Nordstrom and for the Axion black hole. And when you plot the results, then you see the same feature of this ratio going to unity as temperature goes to zero. So in this, reg in this region here. So that relation that I was mentioning before between the diffusivity and the scales that govern the breakdown of hydrodynamics also turns out to hold in these SYK models. To finish with some comments, uh, all of these results, they're compatible with this upper bound that was formulated by uh, Hartnell, Hartnell and Mahajan, provided that we identify the equilibration velocity here with this ratio of scales. But let me um, emphasize that in the case of ADS2 and SYK, that there is no propagating mode. But still, uh, just on dimensional grounds, there's nothing that prevents us from writing this. So ADS2 is very non-relativistic, so it's compatible with this idea that there's an emergent Lycon velocity. But they don't really provide any absolute determination of VEC. We What we've managed to do is express D in terms of these two quantities, which are related to the breakdown of diffusive hydrodynamics. But I mean, it could very well be that there's um, that if this bound is ever proven one case in, in one day, then the velocity that enters here is some microscopic velocity, which isn't directly related to the breakdown of hydrodynamics. It could be, like we said, the Lee Robinson velocity, the butterfly velocity, et cetera. Still, we expect the bound to hold. Uh, sorry, Blaise, but so what you're saying is you don't have an idea about what the equilibration would be in these theories, right? So in, in the theories that I've, that I've just showed you, yes, I do. Uh, it's this particular time scale here where hydrodynamics is breaking down. So then uh, you can prove the inequality and determine what V should be in that inequality, right? Yes, that's right. So okay. in my case, it's this ratio of omega x, the frequency of the collision, and k x, the uh, wave vector of the collision. But then there is another question, uh, but maybe I will ask it at the end. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about the relation to chaos parameters? Uh, as you may be aware of, there have been a lot of studies that have found that you can relate the energy diffusion constant to parameters that appear in the calculation of the OTOC in, in holographic systems and in SYK. And there the OTOC is parameterized by the Lyapunov exponent lambda L and the butterfly velocity VB. And people noticed, observed, that this type of relation held in, in the ADS2 examples and in SYK examples that I've just mentioned. This was also further understood to be related to the fact that there's uh, a skipping of the pole exactly at the, at, fre at the frequency, which is omega equals plus i lambda l as a function of imaginary k in the upper half plane. Now, from our perspective, it's easy to understand why this relation still holds. It holds because of, of this feature that I just spent a bit of time on. Diffusive hydrodynamics works very well all the way to here, the pole collision. So in particular, it holds at the chaos point, which is here, roughly speaking. So somehow the fact that you have this relation between D and the chaos parameters is no different from that relation between D 
and omega and k -yak. It's just coming from the fact that the diffusive dispersion relation is valid at all of these scales. And these are two interesting points to use in order to characterize the diffusivity. But you know, I could also pick this point or that point. And these are, it's going to work equally well. But and then you have to identify a velocity in terms of k, right? Well, I can I can always take the ratio of a frequency and the wave vector, and that gives me a velocity. Dimension. Is that what you're supposed to do in this case? Um, no, I don't know if that's what I'm supposed to do. But you know what the uh, butterfly velocity is, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So in the case of of the propagation of quantum chaos, then yes, the butterfly velocity has a definite meaning as as a velocity, the propagation of the chaos wavefront. All I'm saying is that you know this feature of the diffusive dispersion relation being uh, approximately correct all the way to these really large scales, or these really short scales. Sorry, uh, this is true at any of these values of k and omega. It just turns out that there are two sets of values that appear to be particularly interesting. One is related to the breakdown of hydrodynamics here. Another another set is related to these chaos parameters that appear in the O talk here. Okay, let me summarize because I think it's about time to wrap up. Um, so we've seen that in states with a near radius to IR fixed point, the, there's an excellent applicability of diffusive hydrodynamics across a whole tower of avoided crossings. Uh, with and these crossings are with an infinite tower of gapped infrared poles. And this results in this particular relation between the diffusivity, which is a hydrodynamic transport coefficient, and uh, this is ratio of scales that determine the breakdown of said, hydrodyna of said hydrodynamic transport. And this is true both for a translation breaking black brain, this is true for the Rice and Nordstrom black brain, this is true for the SYK chain. And this is a consequence of the hierarchy of scales because that relation, as you see here from these plots, it holds only in the limit of small temperatures. As you crank up temperature, then th that relation ceases to be true. So then uh, as an outlook, you could wonder what about other near ADS2 or SYK states? Because there are others uh, than the ones that I've discussed. In particular, there are some states, uh, some such states, where the dynamics are not governed by this universal uh, leading IR deformation, which was discussed in these two papers. So, for the people familiar with SYK, these are cases where it's not the H equal to deformation that dominates in the IR. Or for people familiar with holography, these are cases where you turn on a scalar on top of the of the ADS2 and the scalar sources an irrelevant deformation, which is actually dangerously irrelevant compared to the leading one. One could think about adding charge to this, because then it gives us another diffusion mode, and then look at other fixed points, non-ADS2, see what happens, or other kinds of hierarchy of scales, for instance, angular momentum or magnetic fields. And um, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for all the questions. If you have more questions, I'm I'm happy to discuss more. Okay, thanks, Les. So let's uh, give a clap. People on mute. Thank you for the nice talk. Okay, so um, any more questions? Uh, I may have uh, one. The, the fact that you, you, you can get uh, more UV data from your uh, hydrodynamic data, uh, is it also due to the fact that your, uh, your pole are avoiding themselves when they cross, or could it no. be as well that they cross through? The no, that I think, wh whether the poles collide as a function of real K or whether they do for complex K, I think that is determined by you know, microscopics of the system. And uh, because as we see, this doesn't happen exactly in the same way in, in these holographic space times and in SYK. So, so yeah, this, this, there are small differences, 
but they don't really prevent us from extracting the this type of microscopic data where hydrodynamic breaks down mostly from infrared non infrared data. But but I did not get that in in the SYK you can do the hydrodynamic uh, uh, yes. uh, approximation also get the data. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So if you look, at, this is a plot of the energy retarded Green's function that these guys got. Yeah, but they got it exactly right. So yeah, yeah, they got it exactly. But uh, the exact expression is a massive thing, which is a little bit unwieldy. But still, you can take various limits from it. And in particular, you can take a limit where you see very explicitly that there's a diffusion pole. You can take another limit where you see the tower of IR modes, also in terms of some ratio of gamma functions. And then for, exactly for, how these two yeah. sectors, so you have this, think of it this way, you have these two sectors, the hydro sector and the IR sector, how these two interact that is exactly what happens around this point, then it kind of depends on the, it depends on the matching conditions between the, uh, whatever is going on in the IR and the full UV uh, state. And that matching is a bit different in holography and in SYK. And that's fine because really we're not quite taking the same infrared limit. In SYK, the infrared limit is a limit of small temperature, infinite coupling. But in holography, uh, the limit of uh, small temperature is a limit of um, of large M, this translation breaking parameter or large chemical potential for rice and Nordstrom. It's not a limit of infinite coupling. So we're not really tracing out the same RG flow. We're coming at the same IR fixed point, but from two different directions along the RG flow. So based on this, can you tell what's the qualifying difference, whether poles should be avoiding or colliding? No, no I don't know. No, I have no, I have no particular insights. I, I think these are related to the K to the fourth order coefficient, right? Yeah, yeah, but what controls the K to the fourth, then... You know, yeah, yeah, sure. This, I mean, I, I don't have any, any insight on... on how to predict what this term is going to do. But yeah, I agree. It depends on whether that comes with a plus or a minus sign, essentially. I also don't know of a, like, uh, I guess in holography, we could play with the coupling strength as well and see what happens. In, in the example you mentioned, the uh, chaos point was in the hydrodynamic regime. Now, is that only characteristic in holography or you expected this to be more generic? Okay, so let's be careful about words. Um, in these examples, the chaos point is within the radius of convergence of hydrodynamic, of hydrodynamics, right? Which uh, yes, so that's that's true here, but it isn't universally true. For instance, if you look at some of these papers, I think Janssen and Padelidou, and also this paper by Abassi and Taheri, uh, I think there they have examples, and even Grosdanov and company, I think they have examples where the chaos point lies outside the regime of convergence of hydrodynamics. And this is still in holography. This is still in holography, like n equals four super young males, for instance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't exactly remember which you know which case you need to look at, but I remember that in some of these papers they they try to comment on this, and I I haven't gotten the impression that there's a a, a uh, let's say universal principle on whether it needs to be inside or outside the radius of convergence of hydrodynamics. Maybe there is, but I don't think there's anything conclusive at this stage. Okay, I see. Uh, are there any more questions? I, I have another one, more, a bit more general. Uh, there has been a discussion since the results of the Polish group some time ago that in holographic systems and also in, in uh, kinetic theory, uh, um, the so-called thermalization time and hydrodynamization time are not necessarily the same. And usually what's the early one is the hydrodynamization time. Now, I presume the equilibration 
time you are defining is, in a sense, I presume in your examples, the hydrodynamization time. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, so that's the only thing we can say from this type of analysis, right? Is there any dependent way of defining a thermalization time? Well, you could quench your system. Do we know? No. I, do we know in examples whether these two are the same? One is different than the other. Not off the top of my head, but yeah, I could imagine. Take that. Take one of these backgrounds. Put a quench on top of it, and then thermalization time to uh, linear response. But of course, that was done to a certain degree by by Minwala and others, and at least there also there is some ambiguity on how to define thermalization time, and in his the definition thermalization time was zero that is it was immediate right if you remember well so uh, but so remind me the setup right it's not it, it's where you do a small a perturbation you you throw in a small perturbation you solve it analytically from the bulk by, by resumming using vadia yeah this is using vadia but uh, i mean you could do the real thing right because this could of be course of course of course that was analytic you can do the real thing but what they were arguing at least using their uh, definition of thermalization time is that thermalization is instant. Wasn't it uh, only in ADS4? Well, that was in ADS4. Yeah. Well, that you can do in ADS, in ADS, ADS It's more complicated, I think, but uh, I think it, in ADS5 it has been done directly. But what, just what to avoid just logs. Took, but what if you just took short shields and then did an inhomogeneous quench or something like that instead of using uh, you can i just don't know then you wouldn't uh, then i don't think it is i mean I, okay i don't know i'm not i'm not familiar enough with that literature to be honest but in any case you need to go i mean you cannot just extract it from the linear perturbation you... no but i guess what elias was asking is how does it relate if at all to this this Scale from, time, from, yes. from linear response. Anyway, thank you. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you a small, uh, <clears throat> if I can have a small quick question. Uh, Giuseppe, you can have all the questions, but just in case, because it's already been like an hour okay, and a half. You want to do you mind uh, doing it? Uh, do you want your question to be recorded or? No, it's fine. Okay? Yeah. It's fine. You can. We can stop the recording. So let's 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 clap on the recording offline. because it was a very nice. Talk. Thanks.